watching Beyond Markets, where we bring you up to speed on development outcomes in Africa. Welcome. I'm Kenneth Igboman. Thank you so much for joining me on the show today. Coming up on the show today, we'll look at how the COVID-19 pandemic is, is impacting education and find out what it means for the future of education. You can join the conversation on social media and let us know what you think. The hashtag to use is Beyond Markets. You can also hit me up at Kenneth Igbomo. Now, the Commonwealth of Learning was created by the Commonwealth Heads of Government in 1987 to promote the development and sharing of open learning and distant education knowledge, resources, and technologies. As the world grapples with the COVID-19 pandemic, we find out what this means for the future of education. And my guest for this discussion today is Asha Kanwar. She's the president and CEO of the Commonwealth of Learning. Thank you so much for joining me on the show today, Ma. And I'd like to get your assessment of the impact of the COVID-19 across the Commonwealth states. Uh, thank you, Kenneth. Um, let me just tell you that um, the Commonwealth that we serve and we were created to serve uh, comprises 54 member states which cover all five regions of the globe, right from the Caribbean to Africa, Europe, Asia and the Pacific. The population is 2.4 billion people and uh, of this 60% are under the age of 30. And as you know, in Africa, uh, we've got a population of half of that, which is 1.2 billion. And 47% of those people are under the age of 18. So this just shows you that the continent is very young, the Commonwealth is very young, and it is in need of education and training. And what's happened with the COVID-19 pandemic, that 574 million students have been impacted by institutional closures across the Commonwealth. And this, of course, includes Africa. So what is the Commonwealth doing? You know, the Commonwealth of Learning was created to promote distance education and technologies. And now is the time when the whole world has actually pivoted to uh, accepting distance and remote learning. Uh, we have a bigger role to play than ever before. and. Um, that's what we are actually doing now to support, you know, our young people and our states across the world by promoting uh, various kinds of initiatives which we've started. I'd like to get how you're turning this pandemic into an opportunity to improve education outcomes. You know, we've developed uh, several initiatives. Um, and our countries, many of the Commonwealth countries, especially in Africa, have really responded very quickly and speedily. And one of the things which uh, we are in great danger of um, having is widening the digital divide, widening the social divide uh, by going purely for online. And they've used various technologies actually to respond to this crisis. For example, Namibia is distributing print materials to uh, students through various nodal centers where the parents come and collect materials. Botswana is using increasingly TV and radio. Kenya is using interactive radio instruction. Iswatini has created an e-learning portal. And of course, Nigeria has, uh, with the Federal Ministry of Education and UBEC, have created uh, Learn at Home. So I think all these initiatives are very, very uh, timely. What is it that countries have really faced in this crisis? One is lack of content, lack of teacher capacity, not enough access to e-learning portals, and of course, connectivity, which really has this kind of danger of widening the digital divide. So what has Call done? We've created an international partnership on distance and online learning for COVID-19. And several African institutions have joined this international partnership, including, of course, UNESCO and the World Bank. For example, the National Open University of Nigeria and uh, NTI Kaduna are also members of this uh, international partnership. What we are doing is sharing content, which is courses, tools, and expertise to build the capacity of our teachers. And as I said, you know, we have a very young Commonwealth, a very young Africa. And our people, youth unemployment rates are very high at 13% in Africa particularly. So what we are trying to do is build the skills and reskilling people for livelihoods. 
And one of the uh, projects that we've done in this regard is uh, to join hands with Coursera, who's also a member of our international partnership. And we are offering 10,000 free licenses to all our member states, and there are 19 in Africa, um, and ministries of education and our partners to offer these free licenses to unskilled people who are in need of you know, skilling and reskilling and employment. So I think these are some of the initiatives which we've taken to uh, deal with this crisis. What's the, um, what's the level of uptake? You know, the uptake is very good. The up, people are just waiting and, you know, hungry for such initiatives. And there really is a great appetite uh, now that suddenly the mindset has changed that we have to do distance education. Earlier, you know, people used to think that distance education is something secondary and second class, which only those who don't have access to elite institutions will go to. But now I think uh, since there is an appetite, there's a huge uptake. And uh, there's another initiative which has uh, really been very warmly welcomed across the Commonwealth. Because you know when these crises strike, and we are not talking about middle and upper classes, we are talking about you know uh, people at the grassroots level. It's the women and girls who suffer most. And we saw when the Ebola crisis hit uh, West Africa, uh, women and girl, uh, girls, especially in uh, secondary education, when they left school because of this crisis in Liberia and Sierra Leone, they didn't come back. So we don't want the same thing to happen with this crisis. So what we've done is we've set up this commonwealthwisewomen.org, which is uh, an initiative, a mentorship initiative where we've linked eminent women from the Commonwealth to grassroots uh, girls and women and we are mentoring them one-on-one -on -one, uh, to promote leadership skills so that they will inspire other girls to do that. And uh, the other thing which we are doing also is for women and girls is in uh, Tanzania, Mozambique and Malawi, where we are skilling them for livelihoods so that once they have livelihoods opportunities and they become you know, economically so uh, stable and are able to contribute to the family income, uh, they're much less likely to be marginalized. And uh, for example, child early and forced marriage is another problem. Uh, many of these girls will then be exempted from that forced marriage and will be able to empower themselves perhaps for resuming their education at the secondary level. But looking at the future of education and what this pandemic brings to the table, I'm trying to understand what that future means. Some say um, the future is more around, lies around um, blended learning. Um, I'd like to get what your thoughts are on blended learning. Well, I think, you know, the future is going to be online. It is going to be blended in developed, uh, developing countries. And uh, what we have been promoting throughout is the use of distance education, you know, to reach across divides and to reach the last mile. For example, distance education has various benefits. Uh, it promotes access. And we can see that, you know, in the Commonwealth, there are 31 open universities. These 31 open universities cater to more than four and a half million students annually. If you look at the National Teachers Institute in Kaduna, that caters to 150,000 teacher trainees every year. Now, which single teacher training education college is going to be able to do that? So distance education promotes access. It's also high quality. And there's any number of research studies which show that there's no significant difference between the outcomes of distance and campus education. So distance education is also good quality. It's lower costs. If you look at Namibian College of Open Learning in Namibia, we did a study there and we found that uh, what it costs to put a child through a secondary school, the NAMCOL, open schooling, it's one fifth compared to that of a government secondary school. So distance education lowers costs. It promotes equity and inclusion. You know, for example, people with disabilities 
if you look at South Africa, uh, there's a huge, there's just 1% participation of people with disabilities in higher education. The University of South, uh, South Africa, UNISA, is doing quite a lot to promote uh, distance education for people for disabilities. And it's more attractive to them because it pro you know, promotes a kind of anonymity. They don't have to really sort of show that, you know, that they are any lesser than anybody else. And they can uh, respond very well to the flexibility that distance learning offers. And then finally, the other benefit of distance education is that it has a lower carbon footprint. You know, that climate crisis is an ongoing thing. It hasn't gone away. It's not going to go away so quickly. And we've done a study in Botswana where we found that uh, the carbon footprint of a student from Botswana Open University is three times less than that of a student who goes to a campus institutions in the same country. So I think the benefits of distance education are that, uh, and for governments particularly, promotes access, equity, lowers costs, uh, improves quality wherever possible, or at least is of comparable quality, and uh, lowers the carbon footprint. So I think blended learning is the future. The other future is that, you know, we need a range of technologies. Like I said, you know, Kenya is using interactive radio instruction. Uh, Botswana is using radio and TV. Namibia is using print. So there has to be a bouquet of technologies rather than purely online. All right, uh, well, I, need, I just need to hold that thought for a while. Let's take a quick break. Definitely when we'll come more of this conversation on Beyond Markets after the break. Welcome back to Beyond Markets. If you're just joining us, I have Asha Kanwa, the President and CEO of the Commonwealth of Learning, as my guest today on the show. And our conversation is assessing the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on education outcomes across the Commonwealth states. Thank you so much, um, Anwar, as we continue our conversation. But I'd like to speak on that technology role, the role technology is playing in driving the education outcomes. And But looking at the computer literacy levels across um, in Africa and how they can adapt to some of these initiatives that are coming up, how do you think this will play out? Well, I think one of the things which has come out is that uh, we need to build the capacity of our teachers in uh, using technologies and integrating technologies for pedagogical purposes. You know, teachers, everybody is using technology, but merely, merely for communication purposes. We would like to promote the use of technology for pedagogical purposes, for interaction, for promoting independence among our learning community. The young people are already quite adept at use of technology. They are quite good at that. So I think what, governments need to do is to focus rather than on bricks. They must now invest in clicks, you know, providing technology infrastructure, especially Wi-Fi in educational institutions, so that even if people have their own devices, they're able to access, because connectivity is a huge problem. And we don't want this crisis to actually further widen the digital divides. The second thing which this crisis is likely to do is exacerbate the learning crisis even further. We know that there is already a learning crisis. You know, class six students can't read the text of class two, uh, what class two students should be reading. And especially in Africa, you know, 56% of the children who go to, who are in school are not able to read uh, read or do math of that class. So we don't want this crisis to get worse. And what is it that we need to do is to transform our educational systems to make them more interesting, to motivate our students to learn better, which means to use technology in an appropriate way that they can relate to it. 
how do we motivate them? You know, we give them long lectures. People like shorter modules. People like instant feedback. How can we do that, that to promote better learning outcomes among our students? The other thing is that we need to skill and reskill. So we need to look at our curriculum to see what are those skills that, is, that are going to give people access to livelihoods, whether it's employment, whether it's entrepreneurship. And you do know that Africa has an agenda, 2063. And the first goal, the first aspiration is to build a prosperous Africa. And one of the goals is to develop well-educated and skilled citizens through the use of technology and innovations. So I think one of the roles that we have going forward is to promote the use of technology and technology innovations that reach the last mile and the last person in the queue. And this is where, you know, an organization like the Commonwealth of Learning, which as you know, is intergovernmental, is helping member states to develop those instruments and prov providing those guidelines, building capacity, providing knowledge resources, so that they are able to make this kind of transformation. All right, but talking about reaching that last mile, um, we, can't, we can't help but, uh, but talk about the out-of-school children that we see, especially on the continent here in Africa. The numbers are quite alarming and staggering. Are there any initiatives to, to reach out to this segment of, 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 of disadvantaged people in the, in, the, in, in the community? Yes, there is, you know, and I'll tell you about one, uh, initiative that we've started, it's called the Aptus. It's a small uh, server, it's a low cost server, uh, which costs $150. It has a solar charger and a wireless router. We can load thousands of materials, you know, whether they are video, whether they are interactive material, whether they are learning management systems on this little server. Now, if this was to be provided to a teacher and 20 children had access to mobile devices, they can download content directly from this server. And you can have a classroom under a tree. You, I don't know, you're too young for that, but in the you know, 1970s, UNICEF had a school in the box where there used to be a big clunky box with all the school materials. And this was given to teachers and they could put this box under a tree and start a class. Now this Aptus is something, a digital analog of that. And you can use this device to sit 20 children under the classroom, under the tree, and you can create a kind of, you know, classroom without walls. So this is the way of reaching the last mile. Radio is another way of providing, you know, how do you create a listener into a learner? This is something which our educational institutions need to do to use radio as a learning device, to use, you know, SMSs, to use WhatsApp. You know, there are so many tools available now. And the point is that we have to use the tool that is appropriate, accessible, available, and affordable. And this is the kind of advice that we are providing to uh, ministries and to institutions. Talking about affordability, it's quite important, to, like you rightly mentioned earlier, to ensure that the inequalities in the system, you know, are contained so that, so that more people are able to move up the ladder. And I'd like to also hear about initiatives you're, you're doing to, to move people, you know, um, up the ladder in education. You know, the other thing which, which is very important, which Paul is promoting with UNESCO, is the use of open educational resources. You know, open educational resources are free content, which anybody can use, translate, without having to seek the permission of the author, because they've been opened up under an open license. Now, in many of our countries, for example, in Cameroon in 2012, you know, UNESCO did a study, and they found that 12 children were sharing one reading textbook. Another study showed that a textbook in the hand of every child improved improves learning outcomes. So how do we put a textbook in the hand of every child? And one of the uh, solutions to that is to use open educational resources, which are good quality content, which you can take from some of the best minds in the world and provide them to our students. And this is how we actually bridge that last mile. 
And we do know that education and training is something which really takes people away from their social situation to somewhere where they want to go. And we have very bright children. They only need the opportunity. You know, for example, um, there was another girl that we are supporting in Mauritius who couldn't pass, uh, you know, class nine because she didn't have access to a braille textbook. Now, if these braille textbooks, which we are trying to do are open educational resources or OER, and we can put these in the hands of every child with any disability. Now that this girl has all the resources and assistive devices, she's actually going up. She's doing very well in school now, and she's now got aspirations to go to university. So I think we have to reach out to every child according to their needs. And for example, in Namibia, like I said, you know, they're giving print materials. Print is something which is tried and tested. If you give nice story books, nice reading materials, nice work books to, you know, nomadic, migrant, refugee populations who don't have access to even mobile devices. I think we can still keep the, you know, doors of learning open as we go forward. All right, but in appreciating the scope of the work that you are doing on, on, on learning outcomes on the, uh, across the Commonwealth, I'd like to know the type of targets you are setting even um, post-COVID-19. You know, post-COVID-19, what we are trying to do is build resilient education systems. This is not the first and this is not the last pandemic or disaster which is going to strike us. But one of the clear lessons which came out of this disaster is that we were not prepared. How do we build resilient education systems that are now ready to cope with every possible disaster in the world? It could be climate related. You know, when um, Cyclone Ida hit uh, Mozambique, Malawi and Zimbabwe last year, hundreds and thousands of children were displaced because the schools were wiped out. They couldn't go, go back to school for a few months. So how do we build resilient systems? I think one of the resilient uh, ways of building resilient systems is to train our teachers in moving you know, the mindset to a more online uh, way of teaching and learning. And one of the components of teacher training should be crisis management. So that when we teach trainer, you know, train teachers either before they become teachers or while they are teachers, you know, that continuous professional development of teachers which takes place. Dealing with crisis is going to be a very big thing. And of course, uh, their capacity to use technologies. The second is we need to build systems and load all our content online on the cloud, etc. So that even if things are washed away, you know, physical textbooks are washed away, we don't lose our uh, content. So that's the second way of building resilient systems. And the third way of building resilient systems is to start with, you know, equity and quality. So that everybody, so no child is left behind and we are catering to everyone. And as I said, you know, one way of doing this is to mainstream distance education and blended approaches into all educational systems. We are not saying that replace one system with the other, but complement and integrate the two systems so that we are well prepared for any future disaster that might happen. But at the back of everything is quality. The quality of education at the end of the day is very important. You know, and I'd like to, you know, to get, hear your thoughts on how you're you know, putting in place all these initiatives, but not losing that quality of education. You know, quality is uh, very important and we have various mechanisms uh, in place. You know, for example, the quality assurance agencies in every country we've developed guidelines which actually help them to deal with the quality issues even in this moment of crisis, which means that they have to be more flexible while at the same time not losing the quality. And ultimately, what is quality? What we are promoting is that in these resilient education systems, we should have institutions which have a culture of care for their students. And that is really at the heart of quality. If we care for our students, we will ensure that nothing that is third class is given to them. 
we are we respond to them we interact them with them we engage them we motivate them we inspire them all those are elements of the quality and these are not kind of something which can be you know added from outside this has to be put within the dna of our institutions and our uh, educational systems and one of the ways in which distance education deals with it that they first create the assessment strategies whenever they develop a curriculum they create the assessment start strategies they develop you know the objectives the learning outcomes and this really helps to keep us on track and maintain the quality of what we are teaching thank you so much for your time complementarity is certainly a key one to make the advancement of education outcomes on across the Commonwealth states. I've been speaking to Asha Kanwa, she's the president and CEO of the Commonwealth of Learning. And that's a wrap on Beyond Markets for today. And thank you so much for being a part of the show. Remember, you can watch the show at 5 p.m. West Africa time daily and have access to all episodes of Beyond Markets on our website. That's at cnbcafrica.com. I'm Kenneth Ibomo, and thank you so much for watching.